Riverside. Welcome to the Trigger Warning Talk podcast, where we have uncensored conversations, we exchange information, we provide a ton of resources. There's no therapy done on this podcast. I want to thank you all for tuning in. This podcast is being recorded. It will be available audio and video streaming across all platforms. The video portion of this podcast will be available on our YouTube channel, which is Penton Pending Consultant Solutions, LLC and spotify everywhere else we're streaming on all platforms including audible which i just found out a few weeks ago i didn't even send them the rss feed so i don't know how they picked it up but we're happy thank you audible for picking us up and adding us to your platform that's a great honor we have a very special guest in the house tonight today i'm going to be talking to the lady storm herself miss stephanie strong we're going to be talking about a multitude of things and she's going to be coming back because we're not going to be able to get everything in in this hour or so that we're going to be talking. If you are triggered at any point of this podcast, because this is the Trigger Want to Talk podcast, we talk about real shit. No fluff here. Fluff is what you do to pillows and add to cappuccinos and shit. That's what I always say, Steph. <laughs> I don't know about you. If you're triggered at any point of this podcast, please, please, please call 911 because your fire medic CEO brother is not going to show up. Stephanie's not going to show up. You know, if you don't have an immediate need, but you need resources in every episode that we do in the show notes, we have a bunch of resources listed. So we have trafficking, domestic violence, sexual assault. We have those hotlines in their websites. If you have substance abuse issues, whether it be alcohol or drugs, we have three resources for you. We have Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. So we have those numbers and websites. If you are a family member, a loved one, or support of someone with substance abuse issues, we have Al-Anon that's available. That website and phone number is available. If you are suicidal, there is a new 911 number that's been available since July 16th of this year. It's called 988. That number is available nationwide. It's the national suicide hotline so if you have any suicidal ideation issues you or someone that you know or even a stranger call 988 that number will direct them directly to a support system for that particular resource i also want to let you guys know that every episode we do we cover a missing person case at the end this particular case comes from charlieproject.org and we're going to talk about a young woman who is missing. Her name is Naomi Wilson. And we'll cover that at the end of this interview. But without further ado, I want to welcome in the, I, I'm just going to start adding the to your name, <laughs> the Lady Storm herself, Miss Stephanie Strom. She's going to be talking about trafficking, pimping and hoeing. That's what she says. We ain't yep. going to call, we ain't going to give you no <laughs> fluff names. She says, what it is and it is what she says pimping and hoeing we're going to talk about that we're going to talk about domestic violence we're going to talk about sex and based offenses we're going to talk about missing persons we're covering the whole gamut of the podcast stephanie <laughs> everything in one house. so without further ado i'm going to give you the mic i want you to tell us who you are and we're going to go from there the mic is yours i appreciate you thank you so much for the platform Thank you for the work you're doing. I love the title, the uh, the podcast, uh, Trigger Warning Talk Podcast, because I may say something triggering. So I loved how you started with that. And I always tell people, you know, with, I, I, I'm excited that I'm able to open up with no distractions. But if I do trigger someone, you got to know, look at bright colors, breathe, turn the mute on, walk away. There and yes, call 911. Call 911, okay? Because we're about to go in. I appreciate you. Um, my name is Stephanie. They call me Lady Storm because I have worked hard on clearing my storm. Um, I don't know. I think I'll start from the beginning. I grew up in sunny San Diego, California. I was adopted at four years old to a middle class family. Um, 
a white family. I'm biracial. Um, my father was a college professor. My mom, a, a stay-at-home mom mostly. Um, she was an award-winning baker. And at the age of 13, 14, I started running the streets, hanging with the bad crowd. I'm doing the little quote things up in the air for the podcast. But um, I have to say, I may have been rebellious, but I was smart. I was good in school. Um, but a few years ago, I fell upon a word, narcissism. Mm -hmm. And that was like music to my ears because it, it was funny. The first time somebody had told me that it's not my fault. I'm not a bad person. Like I got my mom now, like she played all those games that I read about in narcissism, the gaslighting, the triangulation, uh, the, the fighting and screaming all the time with all my brothers and sisters. It was just a competition. It was crazy. And I didn't want to deal with it. So she dealt with it by putting me out. Literally, don't come back at 14, you know? So I ended up in toxic relationships with other young kids out there put out on the street. And it ended up where hunger occurred, literally. And, and I ended up in being arrested for prostitution. And it started from there and, and it continued. Um, I remember uh, realizing that it's not a rebellious kid issue. It's not a um, abused kid issue. Really, at the top of the list, it's a it's a resource issue. Um, I had nowhere to go. I felt the word was not out where a kid that's homeless at 14, a young woman, should go except to walk the street and figure it out. And, th and then that's what I had. That's what I believe I had. So I think it's a resource issue. Um, so from there, it, it, it started on the street, literally standing on corners, um, getting with pimps that would promise me food, love, family, a place to belong. Um, and I believed it right away because that's what I wanted. And they read it quick. They read me quick. Right. They knew what I needed. And I thought they'll help me. I believe that there are good people out there. And if I be good, just like my mom and growing up. If you do what I say, I'll love you. But if you don't, cut off. So I was running around doing what people said so that they would love me. At 14, this is my process. So they gaffled me up and I got played left and right by a few pimps, even homegirls that I thought were my friends. You know, I had to learn these things the hard way out there in the street on how to protect myself not only physically, but mentally. And it took 25 years. I was in the life for 25 years. It started on the street. It ended up in uh, escort services, Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, I'm talking high price call girl, all the way to being a madam, being the bottom bitch, they call it, where you're setting up calls for the other girls. Okay. So um, lots of trauma in between there, being robbed, being raped. Um, I remember one time, um, the pimp, I'll, I'll, I'll give a short story on that. Um, you know, like I said, he, they give you false promises. So I saw him as my boyfriend and when he didn't come home all night, I asked him, Hey, where were you? And he said, oh, I was at the strip club. I said, what, they have bunk beds at the strip club? Cause you're there all night. And his response <laughs> was to choke me. And he didn't just choke me, he choked me all the way out. And I'm telling you, I woke up to no one there and I, he choked me so badly that I had two black eyes. And um, I'm thinking, this guy killed me. I just didn't die. And still I stayed and still I stayed. That's crazy. Like I look back like, what was wrong? I was always trying to fix things. I'm not a doctor. But I was trying hard. Um, yeah, he choked me all the way out till I passed out. So from there, still trying to fix things. And um, it got worse, got worse, even though he went to <clears throat> um, a rehab, even though I fired him for a few weeks, 
And then you get the promises. I swear I won't do it again. So I'm, I'm telling you, I learned everything the hard way. Um, what else? It got so bad to where I wasn't on point with the job that I was doing. I was slipping a lot out there, speaking to strange men and was robbed by them, was lied, was cheated and got arrested a lot. I was arrested by undercover police officers who will act like they are a client and want to give you money for your time and for sexual acts. So fast forward to my last arrest, that was the doozy because I fought the case and it was a simple charge of prostitution, but I had been arrested so many other times I was, uh, they were promising me prison time. Okay. So I was fighting the case and um, I realized I was on my own. My friends weren't going with me to this court. I was asking for support. The homies weren't there. Nobody would uh, want to talk about it with me, give me advice. I was on my own fighting this case. I fought it well enough that I was only sentenced 90 days and in jail. So in jail was crowded. So um, at this time, I'm not talking to my family. They just don't understand me. And all of my brothers and sisters have some type of issue because of the way we were groomed by my mom. Okay. Um, we're all different. Um, I do have a little sister who's doing well for herself. And um, I was asked if I was able to be on house arrest. And my sister said yes for the first time because there was a few times I asked her for help when it came to me hiding from the cops. And she was like, uh-uh, don't come over here. But for house arrest, she said yes. And that was part of my breakthrough. Okay because I'm sitting there at my sister's house on house arrest and she's got two young ladies, her daughters, a 12 year old and a 14 year old looking at me with the thing around my ankle. And this is where I said, oh, there's me again. I can't let them turn into this. And so I started telling them stories of what I've been through. And, and, and not only that, but loving on them real hard. And, you know, I wanted to scare them straight and I wanted them to know they always had somewhere to go to instead of some stranger. And um, that's where it started with uh, me mentoring someone, you know. So after that, um, the house arrest, that was my goal to not let my nieces have a toxic story about their aunt you know, dead in the street. Because the thing is, the reason I was adopted is because my biological mother was killed in the street. And I think maybe that's where the trauma started. I was having trauma as a baby, then trauma in my own home, then trauma in the streets, and not one resource um, that I heard of. So that's why I a voice today. I want people to know there's real cool people out there that will help. You can tell somebody. You know, there was a time I remember getting slapped in the face by a pimp. <clears throat> and what was my goal? My goal was to walk around the block and cool off and go in a big circle and come right back. And I thought, now I think, why, why did I do that? Why didn't I reach out for help? I was embarrassed. I was portraying this. I mean, you make a lot of money when you're a working girl looking good, got all the, 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 the enclosed, stylish clothes. And I, and I portrayed this, I'm in houses, I'm taking care of, I got cars, I'm telling you. So I was embarrassed. I didn't want anybody to know the truth that really I had nothing. I was handing it all away to a player, a narcissistic player. Now I know that. Um, so I didn't reach out and ask for anyone for help. I, I, I fell right back into it until I saw those, my nieces, you know? So now I'm hiding from this pimp after house arrest. I'm not answering the phone, but this time I'm strong enough that I haven't changed my number. I'm like done. I have purpose now. I got a family that took me back in. My sister and my nieces are looking up at me. So I didn't answer the calls and um, 
I'm literally in an empty studio apartment. I have a blanket and a radio. And it's like kicking drugs. I'm telling you, I had to fight. And I've done it before, but I've failed back. I'm talking about this last time now. I'm not going back. And I'm so excited about it. And I've learned, I've gained tools that I just want to share with everybody because I finally got over the hump. I'm telling you, literally curled up in a ball in an empty apartment. Nobody knows where I am except my sister and my nieces. And I'm hiding out and I'm hearing voices and you're not good enough and I don't love you unless you do this and and you better get that money and I'm just healing because I'm reading books. I fell upon the word narcissism at that time. I, I'm studying like why? Why did this happen to me? I'm learning that I didn't ask proper questions in the beginning of meeting some man, right? I'm, 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 I'm fighting it and, I, and I'm learning things as I'm going and a great thing happened was when I, I was telling you before, when I fell upon the quote on, I believe it was Facebook at the time that said, not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some come to clear your path. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, man, all these storms, I'm talking being robbed, being raped, being lied to. Your folks didn't buy that car he promised you. You know what I'm saying? Your, your, your homegirl is cheating on your man with, you know, like, all these things come with, I'm sorry, they come with sex work. Because a lot of us, most of us are not healthy. Emotionally, something happened in our childhood. Believe me, you, I lived it for 25 years. Everybody got some kind of problem that they shouldn't have. Drugs, hate their mother, was raped by their dad. So I'm dealing with these people and bad things occur. So when I heard the storm is not only there to disrupt your life, because when you think it, of it that way, you wanna clean it up and get it back to where things were. And that's the trauma bond where bad things happen, good things happen. Oh, I love you. I hate you. Oh, I love you. I hate. That's the circle, the cycle that I was in. So now I was thinking the storm is sometimes there to clear your path. And I'm like, I'm clearing my path right now. I'm not answering those calls. I don't wanna go back again. So, I'm gonna let that storm of him choking me out and me getting arrested to clear my path and not do re repeat it because I've been through that many times, many times. So that's where it started for me. And um, I started writing quotes of my own, you know, because that was it. Nobody was telling me that you are worthy. You, you know, you, you, you need to watch out for these things. There's red flags out there and this is what they are. No one told me that. And so I started with uh, on Instagram and Lady Storm posting these things so I could get the word out so nobody has to go through what I did and, and waste 25 of their years of their life with no high school diploma because I, I, I'm graduating the streets. So here I am spreading the word that we are all worthy. We've all, we were born worthy, divinely made, no matter what we've been through. I found out there's people out here that are good and will love you no matter what. Love you just to be yourself. I don't have to wear wigs anymore, right? That's part of the process. I quit smoking. I don't wear weeds in my hair. I don't have to dress up and I don't have to be one of them names I used to use. You know, why do we working girls have to change our name? If it's so great out there, let me tell you, it's an acting job. And that's another thing. The skills, there's skills that you learn out there, definitely. Acting. Uh, oh, we're going to uh, talk about that. Yeah. yeah. We're going to talk about that because okay. you, for me, I heard this, uh, you know, acronyms. I heard this acronym that a sex worker told me one time. She says, we all have PhDs. Oh, yeah. I said, what do you consider a PhD? Because you're not talking about a doctorate. She said, we all have pimping and hoeing degrees as a street worker and i said damn and think about it like that yeah so that's what we're going to talk about next because i want to also have you talk about your breaking free you know because you've been you've you've broken free for seven years and count yes and also i want you because we're going to do a part two because we we're not going to be able to talk about all this stuff about pimping and hoeing and trafficking 
in this particular episode. But let me do a little quick commercial break. So this okay. is the Trigger One and Talk podcast for everybody that's listening. I want to thank you all for tuning in. I'm your host, LP. I have my guests in the building, Lady Storm, better known as Stephanie Strom. She's going to be talking about everything that you see in that logo in the upper right corner, trafficking, domestic violence, sexy-based offenses. We're going to talk about a missing person case at the end because she deals with missing persons also. And this podcast is produced by Pen Pending Consultant Solutions. We're being sponsored by Anchor. And I want you to know that if you want to do a podcast, holler at Anchor because it's free. You don't have to pay anything. You don't need a whole lot of equipment. I know people have all these fancy lights and microphones and all this other stuff. But Anchor allows you to record your podcast right from your smartphone. From any device, you can have an iPad, you can have an Android. Check out Anchor. Absolutely, check out Anchor. And so the other thing I wanted to let you all know is this. When we do these podcasts, what's most important to me is being honest and forthcoming. Because a lot of times when we have conversations, I call it the iceberg syndrome. You know, when you see an iceberg, you only see the 10% of it that's above water. And when people are having conversations, they typically only talk about that 10% because they don't want to really go into the stuff where the pain, the judgment, the guilt, the shame, the trauma, the stigmas, the taboos, the stereotypes, all of that stuff is murky. All of that stuff is in the abyss. All of that stuff is under the water. That's the 90% of the iceberg that you don't see. And I say we can do one of two things. We can either flip that bad boy upside down or we can keep it under the water. I got some scuba gear. Let's go and deep dive. And that's what we get ready to do right now. <laughs> we about to deep dive into the shit because that's what we do here in the Trigger Wanna Talk podcast. So, Miss Lady Storm. Yes. You have broken free and it's been seven years. And I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. And yesterday when we talked, we talked about your butterflies. So you have a butterfly on your shirt. Oh, yes. Where's the pendant? Oh, it's here. <laughs> so I want you to explain the butterfly effect because we talked about that yesterday, but not yeah. right now. Your rock bottom was you getting arrested and coming across this book on narcissism. And from that point on, you started this metamorphosis, like what a butterfly does when they get into the cocoon. For you being someone who was in the industry, when you talk about that lifestyle, for me being a person who's a guy, who's a first mm -hmm. responder, who is doing a podcast talking about all of these four topics, one of the things that I thought about when I reached out to you is I want to focus on the advocacy and the awareness for those that are still in the game, that are still in the life. Right. I want to also focus on the other first responders who don't get the training that they need to be able to deal with situations because I've been in EMS since 2006 and fired. I got in that in 2019 before I retired. I've had one training on trafficking and that was in 2019 at the firehouse mm -hmm. we don't get enough training and awareness about these issues and especially mm -hmm. sexually based offenses domestic violence issues and different things like that missing persons because people call 911 for all four of those things and being a licensed paramedic like i am i'm a mandated reporter for the state that i'm licensed in just like every other medic and emt and other mandated reporter is. And so I always think about, and we talked about this yesterday, how many red flags did I miss in these past 14 years? Ooh. You know, how many uh, people, you know, I, I can remember a situation where um, it was a domestic violence call and we show up and the lady has a large laceration across her arm and it was deep. It wasn't an arterial bleed, but it was bleeding profusely. And so we got bleeding control on our arm and all this stuff. 
And she, you know what she told me? She mm-hmm. said, he always hit me. I never thought he would make me bleed. And I said, damn. Yeah. That fucked me up. I was like, what do I say to this woman as a retort? You know, because she didn't want to go to the ER. And I'm like, ma'am, I cannot take care of this here. You need bright lights and cold steel. Wow. (laughs) You know, you need some suturing and all kind of stuff. I don't know if you have any nerve damage and all that stuff or whatever, because she was in so much pain or whatever. But, you know, I'm like, I need to get you to the ER like right now. And so during the conversation that we had, found out that, you know, this guy had been abusing her for years and stuff. And I had to tell her because we're talking about domestic violence, too. And I said, you know what? The next time that you call 911, you may not be the one calling 911. It may be somebody calling 911 because they found you dead. Mm -hmm. The next time I show up, I may not be bandaging you up. I may be pronouncing time of death for you. So I need you to tell us in part, let's focus on your cleansing. Let's focus on how you broke free. So what did you do first when you came out of that cocoon, as I call it, to get help for yourself? I prayed a lot and God helped me towards a book by Eckhart Tolle called, Tommy, what's the name of that book? The New Earth. The New Earth. So education, I educated myself. The New Earth taught me about how to not be so much in my ego. And from there, I started reading about relationships and trauma. Um, and I just want to say, I was picturing when you were talking about being the guy showing up as a first responder and what do you say? And you told her something she already knows that she could die. But things that we didn't know is that there's people out there that get it, that understand, that have graduated out of it. And they're doing good. And they still have nice things. I'm talking about when, when I found out, like on Clubhouse, that there were others just like me that have what they call survived. I was like, I'm not alone. So the next time anybody sees something, tell them, you're not alone. I know others that have gotten out just like you. There's a whole bunch of people just like you. You're not alone. And when I figured that out, as I was in this cocoon, like I'm literally wrapped in that blanket. I didn't want to come out. I slowly did. And so these are the things that helped me. I educated myself because I didn't believe in no one else. I didn't think anyone got what I was going through. I believed I was all alone. I was told you're going to be all alone because you don't listen. You don't want to follow my program. And so slowly I fell on, I I had to cut everyone off, the people I were dealing with, I was dealing with, and I gained new, very few new people. And these people get it. Mm -hmm. And they're out there. I helped a girlfriend get out of her experience with domestic violence. And she ended up in what they call a shelter, but this was a home. It was a home and it was run by women that came from sex exploitation and domestic violence. I was like, there's my people, they're here and they're, and they're healing. And so I, I learned from them tools that I now share with others on how to stay out, you know, hugging on that little girl before all that trauma happened, things like that. That's what I focus on now. So that's what, that's what got me up standing on my own two feet educating myself and, and finding others that that get it and been through the same thing I've been through. And that's why I call myself a, me- a, a mentor. I'm not so much of a coach. I'm a mentor. I, I share my story and what I went through and the skills that I've learned. 
And the skills that I took out from that game that we were talking about earlier, you know, you have, you, you get entrepreneurial skills. You do. Yeah, that's you, you, talk, you, yeah. you know, you, you get you learn gift of the gab. You know, you 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 can become a stylist out of the game. <laughs> um, of course, a mentor, you know, teaching red flags what to look out for, because we definitely got our eyes moving around and, and, and paying attention to people. So. What are some of the red flags? Red flags. Someone that falls in love with you as soon as they see you. Okay. Let me tell you. BS. Somebody that really is serious about getting in a relationship with someone and and growing and for their future together, you're looking forward together, they're going to take it slow. They want to make sure you're the right one. So that quick, I love you, let's let's fight the world together is BS. That's a red flag for sure. Um, anybody that doesn't want to talk about their past and anybody that doesn't want to talk about their healing. Um, if you see someone that is not wanting to be seen, no, no pictures, these are red flags. You know, they don't want you to mention them yet on the gram. Red flag. I'm talking, you know, I, I, my specialty is relationships, you know, uh, because that's what my th whole thing was. I wanted a loving relationship and I fell into a deep hole trying to find it. Uh, my, my husband now, you know, he, he wanted to go slow. He's like, well, wait, you know, let's, let's take it slow. Because I was like, move in. <laughs> I love you. And when he said that, I was offended at first. Like, what? He's like, I think we need to just go a little wait, I want to make sure I'm right for you and you right for me. I was a little offended at first, but then I it clicked like, this is it. He want to make sure. He's serious. So, those are some red flags. Most definitely. When you think of trafficking specifically, you know, one of the things that we talked about uh, you said you don't like really the word trafficking and we talking about human and sex trafficking because a lot of times people when they think of trafficking they just think of the sex side of it right but you gotta you gotta also add the human side of it and that's why in the, in our logo that people can see in the corner it says human and sex trafficking because yeah. you can't have one without the other i believe uh how do you define both Human and sex trafficking? Yes. Because I it, when I talk to people, I get different definitions. Yeah. So I was going to ask the professional. What's that? You, you know, I remember seeing those posters. I even was handed this well, time when I was when I was out on the street. Mm -hmm. And it would be the the little white girl with with the chains and the black eyes. And help me. You know, yeah, that probably happens, but um, no, I'm talking about smooth talkers. Narcissism, narcissists that set you up for the okie doke. You know, I'm talking about the struggle. You're hungry. You need to get some food. And everybody's telling you how fly you are and young and tender. And they want to have sex with you. It's all on the radio. This, to me, is sex trafficking. I'm telling you, sex trafficking is not somebody putting you in a trunk and it's somebody that you don't know. Most of the time, someone you you, you feel, you know, quite well. It's a trap. Um, I, I prefer sex trafficking over, that's why I don't really like human trafficking because this is what people that aren't in the life think it is. And they think everything's okay, not on my block. That doesn't happen here. I have a gate before you get in. But it happens, it starts in the home actually, most of the time. So um, that's why I say it's pimping and hoeing because pimps are players, they're cheaters, they're liars, they're narcissistic, and it could be a man or a woman. It could be your mama, it could be your brother, it definitely could be your stepdaddy, and most definitely your boyfriend or your girlfriend. I was one. So, so these are the differences. I want you to I want you to go ahead and keep talking about that. Yeah. You know. So when I saw those flyers, it, it wasn't about me. So there there it is again. 
no resources because that you're not talking about me. I wasn't kidnapped. Pippin and Hohen is more about coercion. You know, they manipulate you. They promise you the world. And it, and, or a, even the client, which we call tricks. Because again, people think that sex trafficking is about having sex all the time. Well, why do we call them tricks? Because really I'm trying to trick you out of flat backing, which is called sex. I, I want your money first so you can get tricked. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous <laughs> lifestyle because you may get robbed as the John, as the cl uh, trick, right? So this is all what's involved with sex trafficking. And when they hand me this flyer and it's a little white girl in a chain, I was never in chains, not, in, not on the outside. I was in chains on the inside. I absolutely hate those fucking posters. I'm telling you, when yeah. when I when I was at the firehouse because I worked for a fire department and a, a private EMS service, and I remember when they brought the uh, expert in to talk about human and sex trafficking, and they were showing these posters uh, via PowerPoint, and I was sitting there like, he said, ignore what you see on these posters as far as the pictures. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what you see on these posters is not what we're seeing out in the field, as he called it. This is not what we're seeing out in the street. What you're Most seeing out in the street is people not talking, right? Right. People not and sharing the information. Right. And he said uh, most people think of trafficking where the human or, and or sex, they say you, you think of people being put in a van being brought across the U.S. Mexico border, or you think somebody you think about people being put in some damn shipping container from Europe, being brought over the pond into the United States in one of the major ports or whatever. And he's like, "No, trafficking happens right here in the good old U.S. of A. And ain't nobody coming from no foreign country. And it happens all day, every day, and twice on Sunday. It's happening, and they're using the major highways." They're, uh, you know, the major interstates to move people from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. They're looking and using good old red blooded Americans. You know, I remember so one not time I remember this guy that said he had a nightclub available. And, you know, at this time I was probably 18, looking good, young and could dance. And he said, I need you and your girlfriend to come dance mm -hmm. in my club in Tijuana. I'm in San Diego, next door, Tijuana. Yeah, it's right and across. I'm, the road. I'm with my girlfriend. I feel safe. We're smart enough. We know how to run. Let's go. Let's go be dancers. You know, we literally had to run and climb fences. And we got away that time because it was a trap. So, yeah, it's right under our noses. As a working girl, as a prostitute, as a call girl, a high class call girl, where I was getting paid and no one was even touching me, I went to very nice uh, neighborhoods. So it's, that's why I would say it's uh, right under our noses bad neighborhoods, good neighborhoods, high class. I'm talking about top of the line, famous people. It's not just some monster. You're not going to just see some monster. No, you're dealing with real human beings. So that's why I love to come and talk about it because I think that it should be in every household that we talk about domestic abuse, domestic violence, human trafficking, sex trafficking, and, and, and how to repel from them, you know? What do you say, you say you talk to your nieces uh, during that time that you were on house arrest at your sister's yeah. house. What were a couple of... Tell me a few things that you told them in terms of raising awareness with them to keep them from getting into the life. Well, the first thing I did see when I was in that nasty jail, because you don't just sit there, it's disgusting. And you have nothing but a little piece of soap and a comb. And my eyes were open because there's a lot of women in there that were on drugs. It was so bad. And what happened to me in that dirty place is I had a huge pink eye. My eye was just, I mean, swollen 
ugly. And then they let me out on house arrest. So when I got to my my niece's house, I, I tried to scare, look what they did to me. You oh. never want to go there. I mean, look, I don't even know what it is. Some disease in my eye. I caught it in jail. That was the first thing I wanted to scare them straight because they were young, you know. And then it was not everybody's so nice. Okay. You people, there's bad people out there. No matter how loving and caring and loyal and honest you are, no matter how much education you have on any subject, there's people out there that will try to hurt you. So you need to know how to protect yourself and see these things. And I would talk to them about that. And I would use examples of what I went through. You know, and, and there were times they cried. They didn't want to, oh my God, they were scared. My, my sister, she comes at it. Um, with them in a different way. So she loved it. She is, she liked, I was coming from the street. I'm telling them some real deal. She's telling them go get an education and clean the dishes. And I'm telling them why the real reason why, do you, you know, think, do you think that conversation with them is something that you would say is appropriate to talk about in schools with you know people that are that age you know so these are middle uh what middle age uh, well middle 14 school. middle school probably yeah Heck you, you yeah. Appropriate or even younger even younger like i said in the home talk about domestic violence and, 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 and toxic relationships in general like why not like we need we need to know i i didn't know so much my husband told me just recently I'm sorry that those things were done to you. You just weren't up on the game. You didn't have, I didn't have a dad and a brother that would tell me the real about some bad guys out there. And so I had to find out on my own. So yes, we got to speak about it. We got to have these resources available and let people know about it. These flyers need to have that on there. Real faces. Real faces. Real lived experienced people on, going out there. I don't need you to pray with me on the corner. I need you to just hear what I don't know and give it to me slowly. And that's what I did with my nieces. And yes, young, young, start young because the predators are out there. Oh, it started way young, walking home from school. My sister and I were flashed by some man. And I think I was in the sixth grade. So yeah, we need to know these things. Let's talk about the misconceptions and I want to include substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the substance abuse aspect first, because I know you said a lot of the women that you were incarcerated with had drug issues. Do you see a lot of that? I presume you see a lot of that in the game. Not as much as you think. My really? group of friends. Yeah. Okay. My group of close women that I worked with and dealt with, and that happened because we would work for an escort agency. So you'd see the same girls sometimes, mm -hmm. or it even happened when I was running around all over the United States, you'd see the same girls because it's hot on uh, certain times of the year to go to Florida. And it's hot to go certain times of the year to go to New York, you know? So you would see the same girls. And I didn't fall into the drug scene. Many did though, many did speed mostly, you know, trying to stay up because you're pushed to get it every day so that you're not able to think clearly about what you're doing. So I don't it's care more, who. It's more stimulant drugs than depressants. Yes, okay. yes, no, like uppers. Not, you know, in, in, in opioids All those pills popping. Gotcha. Um, and also at the time, see, I started in the early nineties. There was still, there was crack cocaine, there was heroin just coming up, being popular. But I, one thing my mom did do, and my dad, just tell me, don't do drugs. They told me as a young girl, you know, your head will spin around like, you remember the movie, The Exorcist? I saw it, <laughs> it I'm 70, I was born in 71. My mom took me to the premiere of The Exorcist when it came out in 70. My mom said, that, that's old. drugs. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, the drug problem wasn't wasn't mine. My brother, my brother fell into that. But I was too I was chicken. I was scared. That's why I got a protector. Quotes going up again, that pimp. 
No, I didn't do drugs, but yes, it's there. But let me tell you, lots of women, when they get into the uh, prostitution, they're told not to do that because you got to stay clear minded. You got to stay on your toes. You're moving around. You're dealing with uh, adults, grown men that aren't the greatest. Why are they out there? That's a whole nother subject. Paying for sex and weird sex at that. So you, you have to have a clear mind. That was my thing. I needed to be clear. I need to know what was going on at all times. I may drink a bit so that they say it makes you comfortable. And of course I had demons. So I would drink a bit, but I never fell into the drug scene, but it, there were big groups of girls that did. And that's what I fell into in that jail. I was in the drug section because they don't know where else to put me. But with the young girls, because it's not a violent crime. When you say to them, weird, it's not a violent crime that I was prostituting. When you say weird sex, are you talking about like BDSM, sadomasochism, all that type of stuff? Yeah, pee on me, cut my balls open and sew them back together, um, shit in my mouth. These people are who I need to have a conversation with daily. So I didn't want to get high. And there was plenty that wanted you to get high with them you know, do drugs. Then there's the other pimps that they make their girls do drugs. That's a whole nother scene and <laughs> to keep them down, okay. but up, but down. So yeah, it's in there. It's in there. But that was one thing, one thing out of everything I did, I did not do the drugs. Okay. And I have lots of girlfriends that didn't either. So I was surprised about it myself. What are some of the top I would say, what are what are your top ten misconceptions that we haven't talked about already? About uh, when it comes to pimping and hoeing and, and traffic. Top ten misconceptions. Um, I do believe that what they call it, sex work. It's work, yes. But is it okay? Is it healthy? Um, is it, I'm safe even behind the screen and I'm not touching and no one's touching me. Uh, I think it's emotionally, um, unhealthy. So I just had to say that one because that's kind of coming from the other side, but other misconceptions that people that don't, aren't involved in the life is that, uh, prostitutes, women that work, um, for sex for money are having actual intercourse all day long. No. No, you start to figure out ways around that. You know, I get paid just to talk. Yeah, you start to actually, that can happen. Or just to listen. I'm telling you, I, I've got uh, counseling skills. You listen to a lot of people's problems. Um, another misconception. Um, that we're all drug addicts. No. That we've all been molested or touched by someone. You know, that's where it starts. Um, if, if you're molested, you're going to end up promiscuous and, and become a, a hoe. No. A lot of it is resources, hunger, getting money, and, and no love in the home. Not, I'm just a tramp whore. No. Misconception. There's a lot of women in the business. You know, mothers, nurses. I, I came up in a time where um, there was a recession and, and I, one of my closest girlfriends who I worked with in the escort industry was actually a school teacher until she got busted and they found out what she was doing on the side. Damn. So those are some of the misconceptions. I love the questions though. You're, you're, you're helping me because you know, I went through a lot in a, of trauma. It wasn't an easy life. And so some of it I wanted to, not think about and push in the back of my head. So I do have notes here because I forgot a lot of it. You know, I forgot a lot of these points. You, you, you push it in the back of your head. You don't want to talk about it. You want to think about it. You want to go forward. So it's not easy all the time, but I also have realized that to help others get out. I'm not talking about the ones that think it's all great, but the ones that are stuck, there's sex slaves out there. You know, yes, there's chains, there's ropes, and there's others that there's just, they're stuck in their head. So I talk about it and getting out. But I appreciate your great questions. Thank you so much. I, I, got, a, I got a lot more. Yeah? 
I told you we're doing a part two because we're going to really part two is going to really focus on the human and sex trafficking. More okay. Stuff, stuff. But we talked yesterday about superstitions. Yeah. And I want you to talk about, I want you to enlighten the audience on that conversation real quick. Yeah. You know, going up in the um, game, I was in it for 25 years and I saw a lot of, it's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us became superstitious because it's like a game. Literally, you hear me calling it the game. It's like rolling dice every day. Yeah. So you you believe in luck. You know, I got I got I got a lick yesterday. I I, I got a dude for over four thousand dollars, you know, and so you want to get that again. There's the there's the game, there's the addiction. And so I remember being in an escort agency, and an escort agency, all the ladies would go to the actual building and sit on the couch and wait for a call. And then the call lady will say, okay, you go and you go to this date, right? This is Vegas. And we would actually, there would a, a lady that would come in and do the incense. I was scared of that one around these ladies' bodies and do a little voodoo. So she have good luck like tonight. Sage. Like she yes. Was burning sage. sage. Yes. There was a lot of that going on. We, we're looking for luck. We're looking for a good lick and superstition is involved in sex work you want to get a good day and um you, you try to hold on to something the the salt over the shoulder i remember seeing that while we're eating and um what else was it that we were saying um there's so many um but definitely believing in luck and, and doing something um superstitious you know don't step on the crack they had all that in the life that was all in it for what the beginning of the day what were oh, your let me tell you, if you go to jail, those clothes that you went to jail in, you have to throw them away, no matter what it was. Louis, whatever, because it's bad luck. You don't want to get busted again. Can't wear those clothes. Yeah. What were you saying? What were your superstitions? Those? I didn't. Yeah. I threw my clothes away. Um, I believed in luck. I'm more focusing on God now. But yeah, all of those I mentioned, I, I was I fell into it, too, like. We're going to have a good day today. Turn around three times. I'm telling you, it's the game. It's a game. And you want to win. What were some of the best superstitions or the most? What were some of the best superstitions and what were some of the most weirdest ones that you saw? The, the best was the clothes in jail. I like that one. Don't wear the clothes again that you throw that shit away. The shoes, everything. I believe when somebody told me, I was like, oh, OK, I'll, I'll do that one. Yeah, I don't want to get arrested. Um, the worst, um, oh, the pennies on the floor. If you get into a pimp's car ever, this is how you gonna know you're a pimp. He gonna have pennies and change all on the floor in his car. All pimps do this. Why? They don't want the change. They want the dollars. <laughs> they throw pennies. You'll see it in the, in the front door of their homes. Okay. There's, there will be change on the floor and you step on it. And this is a superstitious thing that to bring money in. I thought that was ridiculous. I never, I never heard that. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you some real stuff. Look it up. It's somewhere else. Someone else is telling. I'm not the only one telling. This is a the lifestyle. It, it, it's a true lifestyle. It's a game. It's a fast game. So they do things to, to keep it going. <laughs> We talked about your butterfly. Yeah. And I want you to talk about that because when I see the butterfly, and we talked about this yesterday, I thought about you being someone who, while you were in that life, it's like you were this caterpillar. Right. And when you got to a point where you wanted to break free and you start reading the the new earth and you start learning more about narcissism and narcissistic abuse and different things like that you put yourself in this cocoon and all of these things that you did getting therapy and praying and you know uh i call it you're getting clean just like somebody that's an addict you know you're going through your emotional and mental rehab yes in cocoon in your mind I'm pointing to my head here for those that are listening to the, the podcast. And you came out as this butterfly. 
And I thought, man, that's so apropos for the pendant and the shirt because now you're this butterfly and you're floating around and you're spreading this good knowledge and awareness and information. You're helping. I say this mm-hmm. people, because I'm a licensed paramedic and a firefighter. People always say, oh, you're a superhero and all this stuff. Thank you for your service and all that. I put you in that same category as a superhero. Oh, I appreciate that. And here's why. Right next door in my wife's office, she brought me this plaque and it's hanging on the wall and it has the EMS Star Life on it. And it says, all superheroes don't wear capes. Mm -hmm. And I was so touched by that. I was like, oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And when I think about people like you who are who were in that game, who got out of it, and now you didn't just say, hey, you know what? Because I imagine that there are some people that got in the game and then they got out and they're like just living a normal life. They're not trying to mentor anybody. They're not doing any motivational speaking because they're still dealing with that. Like they don't want nobody to know. Like if you don't know about my prior history, I don't, I'm not going to talk about yeah. it. Yeah. So for somebody like yourself who was like, you know what? I'm going to take that experience as bad and negative as it was, and I'm going to teach people and I'm going to advocate and I'm going to raise awareness for everybody, including people like myself, who is a first responder. That's some superhero shit to me. (laughs) And that's why I was like, I got to talk to Lady Storm and have her on the podcast because you're saving lives. You're educating. You're raising awareness. This information that you're providing, not just on this platform but on your platform and on your social media platforms i'm learning from all that i got my notebook here i'm taking notes look at all these tabs i got and all this stuff or whatever you know i'm like i can go to other first responders because i'm again in 15 years i had one training i worked for a fire department and an ems service one i remember seeing you guys out there man i remember and i used to think and poor souls, they don't even know what's going they don't on. Know shit. What, what hospital do you want to go to? Yeah, that's, that's what we was asked. That where you want to go? Do you want to go, or, <laughs> you want to, or do you want to sign this AMA? This is against medical advice. Yeah, I remember that. That's <laughs> it. We're so that's why words. I'm not no big old hero. I just simply using my mouth and the knowledge that I have because. Someone's stuck right now, real bad. All I can't even express all it. All superheroes don't wear capes. <laughs> I just can't express it any more than real bad, real bad. They're out there stuck. They don't want to be there. They even tell you that they want to be there. They will tell you they're okay. So I have to, I have to, for my niece's nieces and, and their nieces, somebody got to, somebody got to do that. My mama, my real biological mama was killed. And look, what if that would, it it, could have easily continued the same story. You know, I I stopped it. I had to. You know, one of my favorite movies, because I'm a, I'm a historian. I'm a music historian and a movie historian. So I always use a lot of movie and music references. Mm -hmm. I love Die Hard. Oh. So Bruce Willis uh, in Live Free or Die Hard. He's talking to a guy that is a computer hacker that they're trying to save the world, basically. Mm-hmm. And there's one scene where they're riding in a car, and he at the the guy that he's trying to save, the hacker is asking uh, John McClane, which is Bruce Willis' character. He's like, because he's like been saving this guy left and right, and he keeps getting injured and all this stuff, and like his body's yeah. getting all beat up, and he's like, "Why are you doing all this stuff?" Like, you know, and he was like, somebody has to be the guy. Somebody has to be the one to do it, you know. Yeah. But what has what has it gotten me? A failed marriage. You know, I got all this, you know, I, I've been drinking and all this stuff. You know, yeah, I got accolades mm-hmm. and all this stuff. But look at my life. I'm alone. You know, my kids don't want to talk to me and all this stuff or whatever. But somebody has to be the guy or the girl. Somebody has to be the one to do the work. And I say that to people all the time because I had a battalion chief that told us one day uh, after we did our morning cleanup at the firehouse, we were having this meeting. And he said to me, and I always tell people this story, 
you have picked, and, he, and it was probably seven of us in this room, in this meeting. Mm -hmm. You have picked a job in a career that's literally trying to kill you every time you put on a uniform. It was so quiet in that room, you could hear a mouse piss on cotton. <laughs> and I took that information because what he said from that point was, you got to think about your safety. You got to think about your partner's safety. You got to think about the safety of your patients. You got to think about what you're trained to do. You got to think about your medical training, your fire yep. training, your mental health training. You got to take care of yourself. You got to be an advocate for your patient. Mm -hmm. Here's some of the things that I want you guys to focus on and women, because, you know, we have women, medic and fire, fire medics, as we call it. We went through a whole list of stuff or whatever about what is it? me to be labeled a superhero because that okay. was part of the conversation and he said it too he's like super all superheroes don't wear capes we ain't talking about the shit you see in marvel or dc comics or whatever we're talking about people that are willing to put their life on the line every single time they put on a uniform your uniform is the knowledge and the experience that you have being in the game if if you took me and you mm -hmm. somewhere to do a speech or to give a presentation, who are they gonna listen to more? Yeah. The paramedic or the one who has a PhD from being in the streets? If we're talking about trafficking, they're gonna pick you every day and twice on Sunday because I don't know shit compared to you. Yeah, it's so it's in me. It's in me. You know, I know the difference between a, a healthy relationship and a, and a toxic, slow death one. <laughs> um, and I just have my warning sign up. I mean, it's a, it's always been in me to help people. Always. That's why I fell into it. Somebody told me, we got to do this together and you help me get a car. And I'm like, okay. But I just now I have better tools to protect myself and others. You know, um, and, and I love it. I actually enjoy it. I'm just, just like okay. any superhero does, like <laughs> Batman with his tool belt, like <laughs> Superman with all his built-in tools, <laughs> X-ray vision and speed and power and all that stuff. That makes you a superhero, Lady Storm. Well, I want to make more superheroes. I want us all, you know, that's the goal for everybody to live a happy, healthy, confident clear-minded life and, and let's get rid of all these bad vibes and evil people and and, and believe in yourself and um have a great relationship with yourself and and then you can pass it down as a superhero too that's the plan i always say one of the main reasons that i did this podcast was i want to help us get back to our humanity Yes. What can I do to help us get back to our humanity? And that was bring people like yourself to come in and tackle these issues that we talk about, which right. is what we're getting ready to do. I want you to tell us how we can get in touch with you, how people can reach yeah. out to you for mentoring or whatever you want to do, because we call this the shameless plug segment a podcast <laughs> this is the trigger one to talk podcast it's sponsored by anchor it's produced by pen pen and consultant solutions llc we're streaming everywhere that you get your favorite podcast apps we come out every thursday we just did an episode yesterday that is available all across the podcast world we have real discussions we don't talk about fluff because that's what that's an action word that's what you do the pillows and add the cappuccinos and shit we don't do <laughs> It ain't no therapy in here. We don't play around. We don't sugarcoat stuff. It's real talk. We exchange information. We provide a ton of resources for all the listeners. So if you need help right now, call 911. If you don't need help right now, but you still need help, you're going to call that domestic violence hotline number that we got in the information or the trafficking or the sexual assault. If you got substance abuse issues, call al call Narcotics Anonymous, call Alcoholics Anonymous. We got all those numbers in there. If you have suicidal issues, call 988. That's the national number for suicide issues. 
You can always send us an email at trigger one and talk podcast at gmail.com for any questions, comments, concerns, issues. If you want to watch this podcast, you go to Spotify or you go to the Pin Pin and Consultant Solutions LLC YouTube page. Lady Storm, yes, how can people get in touch with you. How can they well, reach out to you? The mic is yours. <laughs> um, for a mentoring session or or uh, for your family member or a young adult or just for enlightenment, you know, on, on toxic relationships, you can reach me at my email, ladystorm247 at gmail.com. Um, my Instagram is ladystorm.underscore and the podcast where I share my story and um, skills. And I'm looking for people that offer resources that are helping others. You know, if you've got a home that you have open, if you if you teach um, skills on, you know, protecting yourself, if, if you're a therapist, I would love to speak with you on my podcast. The podcast is called the Lady Storm Podcast. So just put in Lady Storm, connect with me and peace, happiness. That's the goal. Thank you. We're going to have your links and I got some of your information posted that on the screen for those that aren't able to watch it. We'll have your links in the show notes uh, when that podcast is available. And so I want to move over to our last segment, which yes. is missing persons. And before I do that, I want you to talk about the work that you do with missing persons also real quick. Right. Um, I'm always looking out, you know, at the end of, uh, each of, um, my podcast session on our episodes, I share like you at the end, you're always sharing, um, somebody that's missing. I too do that, or it's a, a resource for people to reach out. Um, these, these young people that are missing or old, they're listening too. There's ways. So we're always speaking about missing people on there. And if anybody sees a girl, I, I think I sent you a few that I found out about. Yeah. Um, I I saw it myself. I could tell somebody was not where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And it's a missing person. And so if you see something, say something. That's right. So we always end with a missing person case that we're going to cover. And this missing person case comes from the Charlie Project. They are, they are a nonprofit organization. So if you go to charlieproject.org, and that link will be available in the show notes, as all links are for every episode. I want to talk about a young woman. Her name is Naomi Wilson. And the picture that they have and the information that I'm reading I'm just going to read it because I don't have an audio or video file for this case. It's uh, a very interesting case. I got this from our true crime detective slash missing person expert slash rape advocate slash my other half, Mrs. LP. Okay. <laughs> Naomi Wilson, missing since 4-12-81. So that's April 12th of 1981. She's been missing oh from God. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Yeah, 1981. Classification, endangered missing sex, female, race, black. Date of birth is August 20th, 1948. So she'll be 73 if she's still alive. She was uh, 32 years old when she was missing. Her height and weight, she was 5'3", 112 pounds. Uh, she, she was last seen wearing a black two-piece pantsuit. Uh, last car she was associated with was a white 1978 Ford Fairmont with the license plate number David Oscar Yo-Yo 622, and that's been accounted for. Mm -hmm. The distinguishing characteristics is she's an African-American female, black hair, brown eyes, her ears are pierced. Her maiden name is Pollard, P-O-L-L-A-R-D. And I want to read the details of her disappearance. So it says Wilson was last seen at her home in the 1600 block of 13th Avenue Southeast in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, on April 12, 1981. Her boyfriend of three years, 
Colbert L. Billy Beats stated that she behaved normally that day, but she did not attend church as she usually did. Beats attended the midday service, then went to Wilson's residence in the afternoon. He and Wilson left within a few minutes of or on another at 4 p.m. Beats went to his mother's house and Wilson was supposed to get gas for a car and then go visit a friend she worked for at the at some plant. I can't I don't know, I can't pronounce it. Some German name. Wilson never went to see a friend, but B said he drove past her car, which was going in the opposite direction about an hour after he left her house. She has never been heard from again. The next day, when he found out she hadn't showed up for work, he reported her missing. Two days after Wilson's disappearance, B's brother found her white Ford Fairmount that I read about in the parking lot of a Kmart store. And there was no sign of Wilson at the scene. Two days after her disappearance, uh, so this is two days after her disappearance. So she was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, moved to the Shy, which is Chicago, Illinois, after she graduated high school. She married and moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa in the late 70s. She got divorced in 78 and began dating Beats, her former husband's uncle. She had bought a car, furniture, and a home that previous summer in and is described as having a level head. She was a reliable mm -hmm. individual who was making good money at her job. And it's very uncharacteristic of her to leave mm -hmm. without warning or talking to anybody. She moved into her home five months after she vanished. Uh, he moved into her home five months after she vanished, but didn't pay the mortgage. He continued to live there until the house was foreclosed on in January of 82. Many members of his family have gotten into trouble with the law over the years, but none of them have been named as suspects in her disappearance. Her ex-husband is not believed to be involved in the case. And Wilson is one of five siblings. Two of her brothers died before her disappearance. The other two who were living in Atlanta, Georgia in 81, traveled to Iowa in, you know, trying to get doing search and rescue type stuff. File play is suspected in her case, but little evidence has been av available in her disappearance. Now, this case has been updated three times since October 12th of 2004. It was last updated July 1st of 2015. And those characteristics that I read, they have been updated. Now, I've talked about her case before. And to me, it's something that not only is it a cold case, but it's something that I feel needs to be talked about again. Hmm. And in. And again, just like all the other cases that we cover, because 99% of what we do with missing person cases are about melanated men, women, and children, kidnappings, abductions, runaways, adults, babies, kids, mm -hmm. it don't matter to us. And we also cover cases that the person may not be missing, but they're a, they're a perpetrator, so they may have been killed. And the person or the people that killed them are missing or unknown or haven't, oh, been, yeah. or haven't been brought to justice. So I wanted to talk and think outside of the box when we added the missing component of, or the missing person component, I should say, to this podcast. Because we did, a, a when I talked to Theta Person, on a couple of episodes before, and we were talking about, and that show is titled Missing in Plain Sight, you know, talking about her son, Christian Ferguson, who- Oh yeah, yeah, I saw him. been missing since 2003. His dad was tried and convicted earlier mm -hmm. last month, and wow. that case was on court TV. And so uh, we talked about a friend of hers whose son, Donye Jones, and we're all from St. Louis. So this was back in our hometown. Diane Jones was a Ferguson activist around the time of the Mike Brown killing. Uh, Ferguson is a suburb of St. Louis County. And, you know, we're all from St. Louis, Missouri. And so I talked about that case because Diane was found hanging in the backyard with by his family. And so he wasn't missing, but the people or the person who killed him is unknown and so we want to bring media attention to it because if somebody listens to this podcast and they hear about that story they might have information on it. so yeah. 
I want to I want to encourage people when you think about missing person cases, if they died under suspicious reasons and nobody's been brought to justice or nobody knows who they are, that needs to be talked about too. So I want to just put that out there for people to understand why we do what we do. Regarding Naomi Wilson, if you have any information about her whereabouts, good, bad, ugly, or indifferent, or who may be involved in her disappearance, contact the Cedar Rapids Police Department at 319-286-5374. You can go to the Iowa Missing Persons Information Clearinghouse website. Uh, there's an Iowa cold case website. There's a magazine called The Gazette. And there's a Doe Network. The Doe Network, and I hadn't done a whole lot of research on them, but the Doe Network, I just found out, and I'll put it on the screen right now. And I, I'm, I'm sharing this with you, Stephanie, because I don't know if you had known about this either. The Doe Network mm -hmm. is the International Center for Unidentified and Missing Persons. And their website is doenetwork.org. They wow. do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And it says the Doe Network is a 100% volunteer organization devoted to assisting investigating agencies and bringing closure to national and international cold cases concerning missing and unidentified persons. It is our mission to give the nameless back their names and return the missing to their families. So this is why it's important to highlight these cases. Lady Storm and Pen Pending Consultant Solution LLC are going to focus on those stories. We're going to network and partner together. We're also going to network and partner on human and sex trafficking issues, domestic violence issues, as well as sexually based offenses issues. I'm telling y'all right now, Lady Storm and I, and I normally don't speak for people, but I'm just going to say it. Lady Storm and I are serious as a heart attack when it comes to this shit because it's got to stop. And somebody has to be the guy or the girl <laughs> to bring awareness and advocacy for all four of those issues. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're just trying to make this ride smoother. And I always say in the words of my beloved favorite male artist, peace be upon his eternal soul forevermore, Prince. Prince. We are gathered here today to get through this thing called life. How can we do it better? Let's get back to our humanity. I'm your host and your brother, LP, for Lady Storm, better known as her government name, Stephanie Strom. Thank you for joining the Trigger Wanna Talk podcast. And as always, live in awareness, never live in fear. Keep your head on the swivel, watch your six meaning watch your back. If you need any information about anything that we discussed today, send us an email, triggerwarningtalkpodcast at gmail.com. LP out.